Welcome to the tutorial. In this video, I'm going to show you how to make a high quality start screen in GDevelop. Now, first, as a setup, we want to go to our project manager in the top left corner, and then we can go into where it says properties. Now, we want to make the screen size never change. I already have it set off here, but you want to click no changes in game size. That way, when you click full screen, it won't be changing and your UI won't look wrong. The only way you want to put change with it to fit the window size, if you're going to program specific features that make it adaptable. But in our case, we don't want to do that. And generally, we just don't want to keep the game size always the same. So now we want to hit apply. So that's the setup. Now, the first thing we want to do in order to make a start screen is we want to make it functional. And what I mean by that is a functional start screen simply has a play button. And once you click the play button, you move to the next scene. So the first thing we're going to do is actually create a button. Now, in the description of this video, in the description of this video, I have a link to a UI pack and it has a lot of different buttons that you can use for a UI. Very simple pack. I'm going to show you how to use this simple pack and make a great looking start screen with it. So first, we're going to add a new object and make sure you download that link in the description and unzip it first. Then we're going to make it a sprite and I'm going to call this sprite. I'm going to call it play button. I'm going to be called play button. I'm going to import an image from my computer and I'm going to go into my downloads. I have a bunch of text text test assets and I can't even speak right now. So I'm going to go into our UI. And you want to navigate like this. You can go into the UI, go into the assets, and you don't want to put SFG, that's a vector, go into PNG, that's what GDevelop supports, then go scroll down to the buttons, and then go to the rectangle. You could use the square buttons if you want to, but we're going to use the rectangle button. We're going to go into where it says play icon, and then go into the default one. And once you do all of that, you should have a play button that looks something like this. Not something like this, exactly like this. Now we're going to hit apply, and we're going to drag this onto the scene. And now that we have the button, we have to make a cursor. The idea here is we're going to have a cursor. And when the cursor is in collision with the button and we click and we click, then we're going to move to the next scene. Now, of course, we can't use the default mouse cursor that you use on your computer. That's not an object in GDevelop. So what we have to do is make an object that simulates and matches the position of the mouse. So we can easily do this with an extension. It's also easy to make yourself, but we're going to use an extension for this. Now, the first thing we're going to do is go back into our project manager and I'm going to go into where it says extensions and we're going to add a new extension. Now, you could search up something called mouse helper because that's what it used to be called. But you'll also see that it's now called cursor object, It's called cursor object. And we're going to install this into the project. I'm going to close it and you'll see it has mouse helper over here because that's the old name. So I'm going to X out of here now. I'm going to add a new object, it's going to be another sprite, and I'm going to call this cursor. I'm going to call this cursor. Now, you don't have to create your own cursor. You can actually use one from the GDevelop Asset Store if you want to. So I'm going to put Create with Pisco to get off of this menu, and it'll show up new options now. You can go to the drop-down menu and choose a file from an Asset Store. Now, make sure you're connected to the internet when this happens, or you won't be able to access any of these. You can search up Cursor now. And once you search up Cursor, hit Enter, and wait for it to load. And soon, it'll load up a bunch of cursors that match that. So I'm going to wait a little bit of time for the load. Loading and going to count a little bit, two, three, four. Let me make sure I click enter to make sure it actually processed it first because sometimes it may have not processed it. So here we go. We have all these cursors. I'm going to shoot the one that actually looks like a mouse. So there's a mouse cursor right here. And now we have it. And before we X out of this, we want to go into the behaviors of this, of this object. And I'm going to add a behavior. And if I scroll down, you'll see that we can turn the mouse object into a cursor. So I'm going to hit apply. I'm going to drag this into the scene. I'm going to drag it and select it and make it slightly bigger. I'm going to make it 25 by 25 pixels. And if I preview now, you'll see that my cursor has been turned to the cursor object. So now this is actually a part of GDevelop. So this is great. Now we want to program the functionality of it. So we need to use events now. So what we want to check, first we want to check if the mouse button is pressed. And then we want to check whether or not our cursor is in collision with the play button. So let's do that exactly. We're going to add a condition first. Now, the order is important. I'm going to explain it a little bit later. We The first condition we want to add is a mouse condition. And we want to check whether or not the mouse button is pressed. Now, keep in mind, it, this will also work on mobile devices because it checks if the touch is held. So if you tap it, it will also work. Now, we want to check if the left key is pressed. And we want to put trigger once because if we don't put trigger once, as you know in GDevelop, if you've used it a little bit, if you don't put trigger once after input presses, it will keep activating an action as long as you're holding the button. So we want to only trigger once. So in order for it to access it again, we have to press the button again after we've already pressed it. So I'm going to go into other conditions and then I'm going to put trigger once while true. 
And it's important to put it in this order. You want to always put the input first and then put trigger once, and then you start adding your other conditions or else the trigger once won't work for the input. Now I'm going to add an action, I'm going to go into other conditions and events and control flow. I'm going to add and, and now we want to check and you know, make sure you drag the trigger once back over here because it will do that sometimes. You kind of try to correct you, but it's really wrong in this sense. So I'm going to add a sub condition and we want to check if the cursor is in collision. So I'm going to type collision and we're going to check if it's a collision with the play button. And if this is all true, then we want to switch to the next scene. Now, in order for it to switch to the next scene, we need a new scene. So I'm going to go into the project manager. We're going to add a new scene here. I'm going to just call it blank because that's exactly what it is. It's going to be a blank scene. And now since we have that, we add an action, go into our other actions, and you see we can access the scenes now. And what we want to do is change the scene. We want to change the scene to blank. And we don't want to stop any other pause scenes. We have no pause scenes. It doesn't matter. So I'm going to preview this now. And if I click it, if I put my mouse on it and then I click it, you see that it moves to the blank scene, signifying that we move to a new scene. So now this functionality works. Now we're not just going to leave right here. We're not going to just make some lazy, bad looking start screen. I'm going to show you how to make a simple looking start screen that still has a little bit of feeling to it, that still looks decent. And I'm going to also give you some ideas on how to make it look even better in the fundamental principles. Of it. Now, the first thing we want to do is change this background. We don't want to have this blank background. Now, of course, whenever you're using backgrounds, it's kind of a game design tip and a graphic design tip. You want your background to kind of match the UI of the buttons. And we, in our case, we're going to make our background match the color of this button, not the pinkish red part, but the blackish part, that part. So what we want to do is go into our background color. Now, I use the eyedropper tool to get the values to be kind of exact. But the value that we're using right here, the hex value for the background is 1A, 1A. 1A, well, very easy to remember. 1A, 1A, 1A. And you'll see that our background, it doesn't match it exactly, but it's great. It's slightly darker than that, so it doesn't exactly blend in. So now it's, things are already just looking much better. So now that we have the background color, we're also gonna wanna add some text. We wanna add some start text because almost all start screens have text that signified the game title. So we're gonna add a new option. And you'll see that we have text options. We have bitmap text, BB text, text, for most cases, you can just use text. There are a few situations where you may want to use BB text to add extra features, like as it says here, but text is very flexible in itself. Most time that's enough to do the job. So I'm going to name this object start text because that's the start screen text. I'm going to change the size to 100. I want to show you something really fast. I'm going to hit apply. When you drag this text onto the scene, you cannot change the size. If you try to change the size of it, you'll see the text is still the same. You can kind of scrunch it up. But this basically, all you're doing is changing the size of the space that it has when it's trying to scroll, when you're trying to add more text. So that's why we change the size of it in the actual object itself instead of on the scene view. So I'm going to switch this back to what its original size was. I'm just going to delete it. And we're going to go back into the start text. And we want to, first of all, name it. I'm going to call it a good game. That's just some generic name of a game that doesn't exist. And I'm going to go into the color. Now the color of this text is going to match the pink is red part of the button. Once again, the way that I match these colors up and the way that you can match them up is you can look up an online, an online color picker, an eyedrop, that's what it's called, an online eyedrop tool, and you can get the exact colors of certain objects and on your screen. So what I'm gonna do here, I already have this preset value because I know this, I've did it before. So I'm gonna put E4, 2, 4, 5, 4. And now that we have that exact same color that's used on the button. And also, you'll see if I hit apply and I drag this onto the scene, this is fine and all. Things are already looking 10 times better than they used to, but the text is very plain. It's extremely plain. We want to learn how to change that. So we change that by using fonts. In the description of this video, I have a font, a link to a font that you can use, a very good font that you can use for a lot of games. But you can also search up fonts on websites like Font Squirrel or is dio there's plenty of font websites all over the internet so we're going to add a font and the way that we do this is we double click back into our text and you see we can choose a font now wherever you download the font wherever you saved in your files you want to go there so i'm going to go where i saved it in my files and the font is called rubik and you see we have all these different selections of fonts all these different selections and also as one thing if you're going to use other fonts from different websites Make sure that it's either a .ttf file or a .otf because if you don't have either one of these files, it won't show up because these are the only font files that GDevelop supports. So make sure it's that. 
but I'm going to choose the Rubik Black. This works well for most text objects. It's a very bold looking one. And you can either make it bold or italic. We don't want either of those, so I'm going to keep that off. You can make outlines for it. Once again, we don't want those, so I'm just going to take it off. I'm going to hit apply. And you see that now it looks much more bold. It looks much stronger, much fuller, instead of just like a really skinny looking text. So our game is already starting to blow up in terms of the looks of it. Now, I'm going to also make this bigger. And these are some preset sizes that I'm going to use because we're about to add something. Now, you don't have to copy these exactly if you want, but for the sake of the tutorial, it wouldn't hurt to. It wouldn't hurt to, to do it, follow it exactly. So I'm going to change the width to 391. Like I said, they don't have to be this exact. I'm going to show you how. It doesn't matter what size you have them. But these size, the reason I'm using it, it just fits well. It fits very well for the screen. Now, we want to add a little bit more of what they call game juice, a little bit more polish. What I want to do is, uh, there's a very common effect of using start screens. When you scroll over the button with the cursor, I want to grow larger. I don't want to instantly get bigger. I want to like kind of slowly grow larger. And when we're not scrolled over it, I want to become smaller again. This is commonly used in a lot of start screens. And it's just a great way to make your start screen look better. So how do we do this? What we're going to do is use tweening. And what tweening is, is changing one value to another value in a smooth way. It doesn't do it instantly. It does it smoothly. Now, tweening is a behavior that can be added to objects. So what we're going to do is, since we want to tween the size of this play button, we're going to double click into the play button. We're going to go into the behaviors. We can add a new behavior. And I'm going to type in tween, one of the most useful behaviors in GDevault. We can click into it, and it has no parameters or anything that we need to edit. It's just tween. So how do we actually use this tween to achieve the hovering effect that I was just talking about? Now, you can go back into your events, and we want to add a new event. Now, think about it. The condition is pretty obvious here. We want to make it so if our cursor is in collision with the play button, then we start the tween. We activate it and make it get bigger. So the condition is quite simple. I'm going to put add condition. We want to check if the cursor is in collision with the play button. Now that the cursor is in collision with the play button, we want this to only trigger once because we don't put trigger once. I'm going to copy and paste it from here. If we don't put trigger once, the tween that activates because it's an action is going to keep activating the tween over and over and over again. And instead of just doing it once, we only want it to happen once when we're in collision with it. So we want to put trigger once here. So I'm going to add an action. And now it's time to actually change that size of the play button. So I'm going to click into the play button. And if you scroll down, we have all sorts of different tweens for different values. We have color, we have angle. But the one that we're interested in is the size. Now I'm going to show you how to use the tween object scale and then the tween object height and width. And I'm also going to talk about which one's better as well for your game. But the object scale, what it does is it takes the current value of your object and it moves it up a scale. Now, when making a tween, I'm going you always have to name them. Make sure you name it something that makes sense. I'm going to name this grow. And the scale is going to be, I'm going to set it to three. Now, you may be wondering, okay, that's going to make our button become bigger by three times its original size. And you're right about that. Now, you may be thinking, okay, well, this button's already really big. So if we make it three times that size, is going to be even bigger. Well, actually, no. When it comes to changing the scale using tween, I want you to drag your button onto the scene. Drag a new button onto the scene. And when you drag a new button onto the scene, you'll see that this, this value right here, this button size, I'm going to drag another one just for show. You see that it has an original size when you drag it onto the scene. That's what it's scaling up from. It's not scaling up from the one that you put on the scene and resize. It's scaling up from its original object size. So we're making it three times this object, not three times that one. So it's not going to be extremely big. That's why you need to keep that in mind if you're ever going to use the scale tween because that can get you really confused. So once again, we're going to move three times. We're going to grow it by three times. Then we have easing. Now, what easing is, is, these are different presets that change the value in a different way. They're all smooth, but they change it in a different way. Like some of them, it may start off moving very slowly. Then it speeds up towards the value as it, the tween is about to end. Things like that. Linear is just a basic smooth one. But one that I really like is bouncing. Bouncing is very good for a lot of games. It works well for a lot of situations. Then you have the duration of it. Now, for a button, most time you want it to be quite short. Most time, never more than a second. Once it gets more than a second, it gets kind of long. But once again, that depends on the game and what effect you're trying to make. I'm going to make 0 0.3 seconds. We don't want to destroy the object when the tween finishes. And we want to scale the object from the center. Because if you don't, it will scale it from the origin point, which is something I'm going to talk about a little bit later. We're going to scale the object from the center. 
And now that we have that, I'm going to hit preview and see what happens. Now, if I hit preview and I go over it, you see that it grows and that's great. It has such a smooth effect. I'm going to replay that. When I scroll over it, very smooth. But we want to, when we stop scrolling over that play button, we want it to shrink. So how do we do that? Well, first we want to make a new condition. We want to check if the cursor is not in collision with the play button now. So the opposite of the other event. And the way that you make the opposite of the event, you can just make the same event first. So we're going to put if cursor is in collision with the play button, and then we can invert the condition, which is just making it the opposite. So now we're checking if the cursor is not in collision. We want to also put trigger one. So I'm going to copy and paste it here. I'm going to paste that condition. And we want to add another action. We're going to add an action. Now click into the play button. And as you know, we want to shrink the object now. We don't want to make it bigger. So we're not going to use the scale. You could use scale if you want to again. But I want to also show you how to use the tween object height and width, which is better because it's more specific. I generally recommend you use this instead of using object scale. But we want to tween the object height first. It has to be a different name. Every tween needs to be a different name if you're going to do something different. So this tween is going to be named shrink H, and this is going to stand for shrink the height. And we want to shrink it to our original height, the original height of our big object, not the original height of, of the original object itself when we drag it. We're talking about the original height of the one that we have now, the one that we resize. The height of that object was 205. And the linear, the easing, anyway, we want to use the bounce. You could use a different one if you want to. That's your choice. And I'm also going to set the duration as 0 0.3. And we don't want to destroy the object when it finishes. Now that we're tweening the height, we also want to tween the width. I'm going to add another action, go into our play button, and we're going to find where it says tween object width. And I'm going to call this, once again, a different name. Make sure it makes sense. We're going to call this shrink W. And we want to shrink it to the width of 309 pixels. Gonna once again change the easing to bounce duration 0 0.3 seconds for keeping it consistent so i'm gonna hit okay now and let's see what happens here there's something funny that's gonna happen now if i go over to this button and i put my mouse over it okay it grows but if i take my mouse off of it you see that shrink but one thing is kind of weird look if i keep doing this you know, the button position is actually changing and why is it changing now Remember, as we used our tween here, when you use the scale tween, it gives you an option of whether or not you want to scale it from the center. But when we're using this tween height and width like that, it doesn't give us an option whether or not it scales it from the center. So what we have to do is we have to change the origin point because that's what it naturally is shrinking it from the origin point. Now you may be wondering, what is the origin point? You can check the origin point of any object by going to the object view and then you can double click into that object. And then you want to put edit points. And you see that we have origin and we have center. The center is right here. You can change it if you want to, but it's fine where it is. Then we have the origin in this top left corner. That's where it's shrinking it from. So that's why it keeps moving to the left every time it shrinks, because shrinking it in that direction. If we put it in the center, it won't shrink from any direction. So I'm going to put the X. I'm going to set that equal to the exact same X and Y position at the center, at the center um, point. So we're going to put 44 and 84. I'm going to close this out and hit apply. And now if I preview, and now it changed positions completely. That's crazy how like it changed positions even in the scene because we changed the center points. So now if I look at it, scroll over, it grows. I get out of it, it shrinks. And without moving position, because they're both going to the center. That's something that you need to know. And so you don't run to weird problems that you may not understand. So now that that's done, the last thing we want to do is add a little bit of sound effects and some music to spike things up. Now, my apologies. You're going to have to trust my word on this. Trust me, it works. I've already tested it. But you won't be able to hear me actually playing the music in this tutorial, but I'll still be using the events to show it to you. Now, we, can, we already have the condition set up. What we want to do here is when we scroll over the button, we want to make a little sound effect when we scroll over it, only when we scroll over it. So we already have the condition so when we're scrolling over it, which is when cursor is in collision. So all we have to do is just add another action here. And the action that we want to add is playing a sound. Now you can download sounds. Some good websites are mainly free sound that I know of. But you can also just look online for free game sound effects and find a bunch of websites. But don't go anywhere sketchy. That's why I say free sound. It's pretty safe. Now to play a sound, you can go into sounds and music and play a sound. Once again, you can find where it is in your files. Choose a file. 
GDevelop only supports .aac, .wave, and then MP3s and AUG files. Those are the only ones that support. If it's not one of those files, it won't be able to detect it. So we're gonna go. I'm gonna go to where I saved it, and this is a simple select sound effect. You can change the volume. You can repeat the sound. We don't want to. I'm gonna hit OK. Once again, my apologies. You would not be able to hear this on my video, but trust me, this will work. Make sure it's triggered once though, because if it's not triggered once, it'll just keep playing the sound effect a bunch and it'll just be completely disastrous. So now that we have that, we also can add music. Adding music is also extremely easy in GDevelop. We can add a new event. We want to play the moment the scene starts. So there's an event in GDevelop for that. We can add a new event, go into our conditions, and then we can go here to other, and we can check the scene. And then at the beginning of the scene, that's a great condition that is self-explanatory at the beginning of the scene. And what we want to do is play a music file. So we can add an action, go into our other actions, down some music, and then we have music on channels. We have play a music file, play a music file. We don't care about the channels right now because it's not a complicated game. So I'm going to choose a file here. I'm going to go into where I saved it in my files. And we have this title screen wave right here. You want to repeat the sound unless for some reason you don't. Most title screens repeat their sound. It's kind of awkward if you come back to your game and nothing's playing anymore. You can change the volume and you can change the pitch. Now, one thing before we even hit play and test this out again, one thing I want to tell you is we need to go into our resources. You can go into our resources by going to the project manager, going to resources. You'll see that we have all the resources for a game. What we're interested in is the music and the sound effect. So the reason why I'm in here is because you see that we have these settings called preload as music, preload as sound. And basically what these things do is they preload the music. And so the moment the game runs, it doesn't have to load it while the game is running. It's already ready to be played. Now, if you're making a big game with a lot of music, you probably don't want to preload every sound or it'll take way too long for your game to load. But since we're just making a start screen, it's okay to preload these sounds. It's only a few only a few sound effects so we're going to preload this sound effect this blip as a sound and you want to preload your music as a music file so it won't even have to it can just immediately play the moment the game starts so now if i preview this once again you won't be able to hear me you won't be able to hear the sound and the music but trust me it works you can tell by the events that it works so that's how you make a start screen in gdevault one thing before i go a few tips on making some better start screens you can change the animations using events, which is very simple. I should probably make a tutorial on it in the future, but you probably already know how you can change the animation of an object using events. You can use that instead of what I use here, the tween, if you want to. But the tween is better because you don't have to create whole animations, especially if you don't know how to animate. Also, you can create th other objects in the background, of course. You can have a moving background, which is just an animated sprite, of course. You could get a GIF or a GIF, whatever you want to call it. You can have a moving background as well. Also, you can make an interactive background where the player can actually like play something and interact with the background. Those are very interactive start screens that you can make. And last but not least, you can also make a splash text like Minecraft using randomness. And I have a tutorial on how to do randomness in GDevelop that covers everything you need to know about randomness. But you can also create splash text that just kind of creates kind of a fun element and a, even a comedic and a humorous element to your start screen. So that's how you create start screen in GDevelop. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did enjoy the video, make sure to like, hit the like button you want, make sure you comment, subscribe, and then hit the notification bell as well so you never miss out on any of my new tutorials. You can also become a member of Q the Game Dev, support the channel, get a few extra perks, get videos sent to you early, have premium suggestions as well. You can all become a member of Q the Game Dev for $0.99 a month. And it also just helps to support the channel, even if you don't care about the extra perks. Once again, I hope you all enjoyed this tutorial, and I'll catch you in the next video. See ya.